Hi everyone, I'm Prentice Rollins and welcome to lesson number two in my 10-part course on creating comics. Last time I gave you an introduction to comics as an art form and a form of sequential storytelling and I gave you a quick tour of the steps involved in making a comics page and a quick introduction to the kinds of tools traditionally used by comics artists. I know, it was a lot of information, and I hope you're not too dizzy. The fact that you're watching lesson number two tells me that you actually want to hear more of this, and I'm glad you're back. And once again, I'm super happy to be able to share with you my insights from a lifetime of writing and drawing comics. In this class, I'm going to be talking to you about stories and storytelling. As I said in the last class, comics is a form of sequential storytelling. It tells stories by means of static images arranged in sequence, usually with text or word balloons added in. A well-rounded comics creator ought to have a bedrock of knowledge about what stories are and what makes them good or bad. That way, whether you're writing your own comic stories or just illustrating comic stories written by somebody else, you'll be able to uh, assess the quality of what you're working on. And you'll have a guidepost for making or just suggesting improvements. I'm going to keep things simple, but listen close because it's important. And I promise you that in class number three, we're going to be doing some seriously fun drawing. Spoiler alert, it's going to be about perspective, one of the most critical skills a comics artist needs to master. Okay, what are stories? It's, a hard, it's hard to answer a question like that, because stories and storytelling are so basic to human nature and so pervasive and <clears throat> taken for granted. But a story is what happens when you convey to another person through words, images, or both, something that happened. Stories are absolutely fundamental to human nature. Think about this. On any given night, the average person spends three or four hours dreaming. Some of the dreams you remember, most of them you don't. Of the ones you remember, some are just uh, nonsense. Heaps of disjointed, strange images. But some of them convey a narrative, tell a story. You're in a house. A strange person has made you a lavish meal. You sit down to eat and suddenly realize uh, you're missing an important uh, math exam. You get up and try to leave, but discover that the uh, door is locked and that you're wearing a pink clown suit. Uh, and can't show up to class dressed like this. And then you wake up in a cold sweat. Who is telling the story? Well, it's not you, really. Uh, after all, you're sound asleep and in no condition to be making up stories. The story is welling up from the deepest recesses of your mind, okay? You're unconscious. Storytelling is literally something we can all do in our sleep. That's how incredibly fundamental it is. Humans are designed to convey information in linear, sequential, narrative fashion. This happened, and then this happened, and then that happened, and boom, that's the end of the story. People have been telling stories since language existed, which is many, many thousands of years. Novels, 
poems, songs, movies, TV shows are all ways of telling stories. And though comics is relatively new as an art form, it too, at heart, is a form of telling stories. A story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Or, to put it in more technical terms, a traditional story has three acts. Act 1, Act 2, and Act 3. Generally speaking, in Act 1 of a story, the characters are introduced. One of the characters is what's known as the protagonist. The protagonist is the main character. Usually, the protagonist is what you would call a good guy or gal. Someone the reader or, or audience can like and can identify with. But the protagonist isn't always a good person. The protagonist is just the character who is trying to do or accomplish something. The word protagonist is a Greek word that literally means he who suffers most. Batman is a classic comic book protagonist, but he isn't uh, completely good. He's full of anger, rage, sadness, and the desire for vengeance. And that's a big part of what makes him do the things that he does. Oftentimes, in Act 1 of a story, we are also introduced to the antagonist. The antagonist of a story is frequently a bad guy or gal, a villain, Darth Vader, is the antagonist in Star Wars. And Darth Vader is pretty clearly a bad guy. But the crucial thing about the antagonist is that he or she is the person who is trying to stop the protagonist from doing what they want or need to do. The antagonist is the main obstacle in the way of the protagonist. Act one of a traditional story usually ends with something bad happening to the protagonist. In technical terms, the protagonist uh, suffers a reversal. In Act 2 of a traditional story, the protagonist launches on his or her mission or quest, and the dramatic tension rises. Act 2 usually also ends with the protagonist having another setback or reversal. In Act 3 of a traditional story, the dramatic tension in action rises even further, leading to the climax of the story, the part where the protagonist achieves or accomplishes uh, what he or she was trying to do. The antagonist is usually beaten or revealed to be powerless and ineffective. This is a huge thing. Given the two big setbacks or reversals the protagonist has uh, suffered. And it's a very satisfying thing for the reader or audience. One of the crucial things about good stories is that the protagonist changes in the course of the story. He or she goes from point A to point B. They learn something important and they are a better and more complete person at the end of the story than they were at the beginning. This change is often accompanied by what's called an epiphany. A sudden realization or a flash of sudden insight and wisdom. I'm going to illustrate all of this with, with an example from the movies. <clears throat> the movie I'm going to talk about is Star Wars. The original Star Wars from 1977. If you haven't seen it, it's okay. You can still follow along. But I'd advise you to see it if you're interested in telling your own stories. Because it's a great film and a great story. One of the things that made and continues to make Star Wars so appealing is the fact that it exemplifies traditional storytelling in a perfect way. Everything I've mentioned about story structure is in Star Wars. So it makes a great standard or test case 
for good storytelling. In Act 1, we're introduced to the protagonist, Luke Skywalker. Luke is a restless farm boy trapped on a remote planet. He wants to escape and have a life of adventure, a more significant life. Soon, he meets Obi-Wan Kenobi, an old Jedi Knight, who urges Luke to come with him to help a beautiful princess named Leia. Uh, she's one of the leaders of a rebellion against the evil Galactic Empire. Luke refuses, because he feels he can't just abandon the aunt and uncle who have raised him. But he soon finds that his aunt and uncle have been murdered by the Galactic Empire. This is a huge reversal for Luke, a life-changing setback. He agrees to go with Obi-Wan, because now he has no choice. And that's the end of Act 1. In Act 2, Luke and Obi-Wan get trapped inside the Death Star, the Empire's main weapon, in their quest to help Princess Leia. Luke rescues Leia, but Obi-Wan is murdered by Darth Vader, the antagonist. This is an even bigger reversal for Luke, who is totally devastated. And so ends Act 2. In Act 3, Luke leads a battle against the Death Star, and against huge odds, he destroys it and defeats Darth Vader. This is the climax of the story, and the end of Act 3. Luke has his epiphany just before he destroys the Death Star. He realizes that he can trust himself and his feelings. Luke changes massively over the course of the story. He travels from point A to point B. At the beginning of the story, he's a naive farm boy without confidence or belief in his own abilities. At the end of the story, he's learned to trust himself, and because of that, he becomes a hero. Many, many famous stories follow this basic pattern. Star Wars, Titanic, The Wizard of Oz, the Terminator, The Lord of the Rings, Jaws, all of these famous films are about a naive person leading a sheltered life who is suddenly thrust into a terrifying situation they don't feel able to deal with. And they're only able to emerge victorious when uh, they realize in the end that they have the power within themselves to be courageous and to deal with it. This is a universally satisfying story because it springs from the very structure of human psychology. It's a universal theme that everyone can understand and appreciate. Now take a look at this. Here we have Jack Dawson from Titanic, Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz, Spider-Man, Harry Potter, Cinderella, Ray from Star Wars, Batman, Black Jack from the anime series, and Luke Skywalker from Star Wars. What's the one thing all these famous characters have in common? They are all orphans. They all somehow lost their real parents, were raised by someone else, and became heroes. I'm not saying you have to make your own characters orphans. I'm just pointing out that this is another one of those story elements that springs from the universal nature of the human mind. We all feel like orphans from time to time, lost and alone in an unfriendly world. These things are universal, part of our shared humanity. And they are what move readers and make them interested. Not all stories are like this, and you shouldn't try to hammer a story you want to tell into this mold. The main thing I want you to take away is the fact that most stories have a three-act structure, uh, a protagonist and an antagonist, 
and feature rising action and tension and a series of setbacks for the protagonist and in the end a huge success which is the climax of the story and most importantly the protagonist progresses he changes and grows over the course of the story that growth is the human element that speaks to readers, that uh, gets their attention and keeps them interested. That is what they will remember about your story. If you're writing your own comic story, don't obsess over the three-act structure. Just write from the heart. And if it really is a story, it will probably fall quite naturally into the three-act pattern because the three-act pattern is basically built into human psychology and governs the way we tell stories. Just to show you what I mean, here's a funny thing. In the West, there's an ancient nursery rhyme which you may be familiar with. It goes like this. Mary had a little lamb its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. It followed her to school one day, which was against the rule. It made the children laugh and play to see a lamb at school. This is another perfect little story. In Act One, we are introduced to the protagonist, Mary. She has a little lamb that always follows her around. So far, so good. In Act Two, there's rising tension. The lamb follows Mary to school, which is against the rules. This is a reversal for Mary, a very minor reversal, but still a reversal. What's going to happen? In Act Three, we have the climax. The other children are delighted and uh, laugh and play as a result. Happy ending for Mary. It's a very simple story, but literally every child in the English-speaking world hears this when they're learning to talk. And no one ever pauses to consider that it's a proper three-act story with a uh, protagonist, a reversal, and climax. In comics, stories are told using words but mainly using pictures. The pictures themselves are ambiguous, and the meaning of the story only becomes clear when the pictures are combined. Here's an example of what I mean. Here are eight simple pictures I drew, labeled one through eight. In image one, we see a guy with a rifle. He's probably a hunter. In two, we have a closer view of this guy, looking happy. In three, we have an even closer view, and he's touching his face. Maybe he's calling someone, or maybe he's scratching an itch, who knows? In four, we have an extreme close-up of an eye with a tear coming out of it. In five and six, we have a bird flying around, and in seven, we have a bird falling from the sky trailing feathers behind it. And in eight, we have a rifle firing with a bang sound effect. Now as it is, with the panels arranged like this, we don't have a story, just nonsense. But I can arrange the panels to get at least six different stories. Let's look at three of them. Here's the eight panels rearranged one way. Here we see a hunter out hunting. Suddenly, a bird appears, and he raises his rifle and fires. The bird appears to be unharmed and keeps flying. The hunter is sad at his failure, and a tear comes out of his eye. But wait! The bird falls. He must have hit it after all. He brushes his tear away when he realizes this, and in the last panel, we see that he's happy because he successfully got the bird. 
Now look at this arrangement. We see at first just a crying eye. Who is it? Who's crying and why? In the next panel, the camera pulls back and we see that it's a man, but we still don't know who. He appears to be wiping the tear away. In panel three, we see a bird. In panel four, we pull back even further and see that the man is carrying a rifle. He's probably a hunter. In the next panel, we see the bird again. It's closer than it was before. It's bigger than in the previous panel, and it's moved up and to the right. We see the rifle firing next, and then the bird plummeting downwards. In the last panel, the hunter is happy. We can now surmise that he was crying at the beginning because uh, he wasn't having uh, any luck hunting. Now look at this third arrangement. In the first panel, we see a hunter out walking with his rifle. Then a bird appears, and we see that the hunter is happy about this. The bird gets even closer in the next panel. The hunter fires his rifle, and the bird plummets from the sky. Then we see a close-up of a tear coming from the hunter's eye. In the last panel, he's either touching the tear or brushing it away. He seems to be realizing that maybe he's done the wrong thing and that uh, hunting isn't for him after all. Again, each of the eight panels is ambiguous, viewed by itself. They could mean just about anything. It's only when they are put together in sequence that meaning emerges. And that's how comics works. And you'll notice that the eight panels are different from each other in significant ways. Panel one is a medium shot showing a full figure doing something, namely walking with a rifle. Panel 2 is a medium close-up, showing the same figure, but he's smiling, showing a positive emotion. Panel 3 is a close-up, and the figure is doing something ambiguous. Scratching an itch, brushing away a tear, who knows? Panel 4 is an extreme close-up, an eye with a tear coming out of it. In general, the tighter you close in on a character's face, the more drama and emotion you create because you are making the character uh, more and more intimate with the reader. <clears throat> so you should use close-ups and especially tight close-ups uh, carefully and uh, sparingly. Use them when you want to uh, <clears throat> really draw the reader into the character's world and make the reader identify with the character's uh, emotions. Panels five and six are just boring medium shots of a bird in flight, but by having them next to each other you can create the, uh, the illusion of motion. <clears throat> this is helped by the fact that the bird in panel six is bigger than the one in panel five and so seems to be closer to us. Panel seven shows a bird falling to earth and here we use motion lines to reinforce the impression that the bird is falling uh, fast. Motion lines are what you would call a comic book convention. <clears throat> That is, they are part of the visual language of comics, and you see them all the time in Western comics, but even more in manga and other Asian comics. Panel 8 is a medium shot of a rifle firing, and here we see uh, two more comic book conventions. The uh, use of a burst to signify an explosion, and the use of a uh, written sound effect, bang, to uh, signify a loud sound. These conventions are also seen all over Western and Eastern comics. 
Now let's take a look at, at these two pages from a comic short story I wrote and drew. I, I know that in the Eastern world, comics are generally read from right to left, but this is read from left to right. The first panel of the first page is what's called an establishing shot. Okay? It establishes some key facts about what's going on in the story. We can see that there is an old man and a boy, uh, probably his grandson, sitting on a bench in a park in a city. <clears throat> I wanted this page to have a large dominant panel to act as the focus of attention. In panels two and three, we have medium close-ups of the boy and the old man talking. I wanted to establish their rapport. The boy is showing the old man some of his toys, and the old man is uh, sort of pretending to be fascinated. In panel four, we have a close-up of the boy, and in panel five, we have a tight close-up of the old man. So as you can see, the camera is slowly zooming in over the course of this page, drawing the reader into more intimacy with these two characters. I wanted the reader to like and identify with these characters right from the beginning. So I made them look physically appealing and created a sense of intimacy with the camera work. As a comics artist, you have to think of yourself as the director and cinematographer of a sort of movie you're making. It's a comic, of course, not a movie, but you have to learn to think like a filmmaker sometimes. Because, like a filmmaker, you're creating drama and emotion by picking angles, close-ups, establishing shots, etc. <clears throat> the first two panels of page two are the exact same composition, a medium close-up uh, of the two characters. I did this to encourage the impression of action. The old man is playfully mussing the boy's hair in panel two. This action flows easily out of the uh, action of panel one, with very pleasing effect. Panel three is huge and dominant on this page. It's almost a portrait of these two characters. Each character occupies half the panel, but the boy is smaller, the old man is larger, closer to camera, and slightly above the boy. This subconsciously uh, conveys his dominance. But the two characters are looking in the same direction. Um, they have the same expressions on their faces and they have uh, identical lighting effects uh, on their faces. These things uh, subconsciously convey the impression that these two are linked and in some very real aspect, uh, both the same. This is a short six-page story that was basically about the similarities and differences between small children and old people. The old man and his grandson are basically playmates at the beginning, and then something happens that uh, makes the old man realize that because of his long and bitter experience, he and his grandson are separated by an unbridgeable, unbridgeable gulf. The story is sweet, funny, and ultimately sad. And I had to call upon all my skills as a cinematographer to make it work <clears throat> in six short pages. The other thing I want you to notice is the fact that when the two characters are seen together in a single panel, the boy is always on the left and the old man is always on the right. This is in accordance with what's known in comics as the 180 degree rule. When you draw a page, if there are two characters interacting 
and one of them is on the right side and one of them is on the left side in the first panel. Never rotate the camera more than 180 degrees in any of the other panels. In other words, keep them on the left and right respectively in all the other panels. This is a small thing that keeps readers from getting confused. Readers are very lazy, unlike comics artists. Uh, you need to make things easy for them, and this is a small way to do that. The last thing I want to introduce you to today is a crucial concept from fiction, movie making, and comics creation, world building. When you are writing or drawing your own comics, you are the god of whatever world you're creating. And as such, it's your job to know everything about that world. Not literally everything, but at least everything that's relevant to the story you're creating. If you're creating characters, you have to know what their history is, what's happened to them, to make them the way they are. And if you're creating a science fiction or fantasy world, you have to have decided things about its history that made it um, what it is. Take a look at these pages. These are designs I drew for a science fiction graphic novel I'm currently working on. I did all of these before I actually started drawing the comics pages themselves. Now you may be thinking that this looks like an awful lot of work uh, to do before you even start drawing the pages, but believe me, it's a time saver in the end. By having these designs done and ready to go, I can just refer to them over and over while drawing the pages. All the design work is done, and everything uh, looks consistent from page to page because I have these pre-done reference sheets to look at. And when I was doing these, I was constantly looking at reference photos found on the internet. Photos of people, boats, cities, the reason I was doing that was I wanted everything to look authentic, not just kind of made up. Authenticity and realism are huge for me. I never want the things in the comics I draw to look made up. I want them to look like I actually saw them and drew them from life. As a comics artist, you have to constantly use reference images when you're drawing things, uh, houses, cars, people, coffee cups, animals, everything. And with the internet, it's easier than ever to do this. Uh, once upon a time, a comics artist had to keep, uh, had to make and keep reference files, um, that is paper folders full of pictures clipped out of magazines and newspapers, uh, pictures of people, places, things, etc. But with the internet, you don't have to do that anymore. All of this falls under the heading of world building. Make the world you're creating look real, authentic, and thought through. If it doesn't look believable and real, your reader won't believe it and won't be interested in it. If it doesn't look like you could be bothered to uh, think through your world and design it, the reader won't want to be bothered to read about it. That brings us to the end of lesson two. Thanks so much for being here with me. Next time, we're going to jump into perspective, one of the really crucial skills for the comics artist. To wrap things up, I'm going to give you a quick demonstration of me designing something cool. 
using reference photos just to give you an idea of my process in designing um, something for a comic story. Follow along if you want to, or just relax and watch. Up to you. Hi everyone, okay. Um, as you can see, I'm using my tablet and computer for ease and speed of this demonstration. Um, I found on the internet, just, um, you know, looking around, this kind of cool image of this big battleship. And so I've decided I'm going to draw some kind of um, futuristic science fiction battleship. Um, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna kind of use this as um, as reference. I love drawing big, crazy science fiction vehicles. And I remember when I was a kid, there was a cartoon show called, um, <clears throat> in America it was called Star Blazers. But I think in, uh, I think it went by a different title in other parts of the world, Battleship Yamato, I think. Anyway, it had this giant spaceship which looked like a battleship and I was really impressed by it so I'm kind of thinking about that too I'm using my imagination a lot I'm just making a lot up but I'm kind of glancing at this um, photograph of a real battleship just to give me ideas and to make it look um, a little bit more authentic, a little bit more rooted in reality. I'm always using reference. I'm always looking at photographs of real things. Sometimes when I <clears throat> feel like I need an idea, I'll look at um, what other artists have drawn. I have a number of um, artists who uh, are my favorites and who influenced me pretty heavily. So I'm always sort of returning to their work to get um, guidance and inspiration. Right now I'm thinking more in terms, getting a little hung up on the details and I shouldn't be. I should be thinking more in terms of um, big masses and basic shapes. So let's concentrate on that for a few minutes.
couple of uh, radar dishes up there. Put some big guns on this thing to make it look, yeah, like it's meant for war. What are these? Who knows? It doesn't matter. I think they just kind of look cool. There's this second little conning tower bridge right here. In the actual ship, so I'm going to make something like it in this one. I'm going to talk about um, perspective in uh, next week's lesson. <clears throat> and you can see the, uh, the perspective in this drawing is pretty good. It may not be perfect, but it's pretty good. And I'm able to do this just spontaneously because I've been drawing things like this um, for so long. It's had a lot of practice. Practice is uh, pretty crucial. You get better at anything by practicing. And I don't consider myself somebody with a lot of inborn talent. My skill is more the result of just uh, practice. I think I'm going to make this bigger. Just kind of adding some uh, 
details. At this point, I'm not really looking at the reference that much anymore. I'm kind of uh, winging it and taking it in my own direction. Just because I'm having fun with it. Some crazy pipes. make this gun a little bit bigger and more involved. Okay. So, once again, I think that's enough for now. I like it. There's our original image, uh, an actual battleship. And here's our kind of imaginative science fiction reconstruction of a space-going battle cruiser of some kind. And I was kind of glancing back at the actual image quite a bit during the drawing of this, just to get ideas to, um, to make it look more real and authentic and believable. Okay. That's all for today, everyone. Thanks for being here. Once again, next time we're going to tackle perspective. Till I see you again, be well, and keep on practicing. Bye-bye for now.